Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can I ask you all to please take your seats so that we can start? I'm hoping that you can all hear me okay. Thank you. So our friends at the back who are still having a conversation, we'd like to make a start. Thank you. If everybody can find their way to their seats. Okay. It's my, my name <clears throat> is Theo Soa, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this side event on building a foundation of Africa free of cervical cancer, reaffirming commitments to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem in the African region. And this is a side session that has been co-hosted by the WHO Regional Committee for Africa, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, UNITAID, Gavi, UNICEF, the Global Financing Facility, and the Grasa Michelle Trust. As I open this meeting, if I could call our distinguished panelists to please come up to the stage and take your seats. You'll see your name, um, your name tags in front of the seats that you can take. So as our panelists are taking their seats, I just wanted to say that last week in Habarun, a first meeting of Uniting for Cervical Cancer Elimination was held. When I say it was a first meeting, it was a first meeting of cervical cancer survivors and caregivers and their allies. And the survivors and caregivers came together to share experiences, to share knowledge, and to look at how they could make their experience and knowledge count as African countries came together with cervical cancer elimination strategies. They looked at what they could do to make sure that their lived experience made a difference in the way that we fought the scourge of cervical cancer. And they looked at how they could work together to support their countries, their governments, our financing partners, international organizations, and all the people who should be working to eliminate cervical cancer. In addition to the amazing African women from many different countries across our continent, that meeting was graced by Madame Grasa Michelle. And I'm telling you this because 15 years ago, Grasa Michelle was chair at Gavi when the HPV vaccine was struggling to be introduced. And it was a daughter of Africa and several African countries who pushed that battle who fought to make sure that HPV vaccines could be adopted, that, that they could become a part of this fight against cervical cancer. And one of the things that she said last week when she was speaking and working with the survivors was how shocked she was that 15 years later, we're still struggling to get proper take-up and distribution of the HPV vaccine, proper screening and proper treatment for cervical cancer and the women of Africa. We hope that at the end of this meeting, you will all feel re-energized, reinvigorated, and ready for us to really push that struggle much, much further and to not lose another generation of African women to cervical cancer when we have the knowledge, 
and the tools and the resources to make these deaths stop. We're going to start the evening with some welcoming remarks from Her Excellency, Mrs. Masisi, the First Lady of Botswana. Unfortunately, she had to travel, and so before she traveled, she put together this welcoming video. Honorable Ministers, Heads of Delegations, International Organizations, WHO Regional Director for Africa, Dr. Matsuriso Moeti, distinguished guests, good evening to you all. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to welcome you to this session held on the sidelines of the 73rd session of the Regional Committee. The theme of this side event, Building a Foundation of Africa Free of Cervical Cancer, Reaffirming commitments to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem in the African region, which is in line with the WHO's global strategy for the elimination of cervical cancer. First and foremost, let me thank the co-hosts of this event, WHO Africa Region, Grasha Michelle Trust, Gavi, UnitAid, the Global Financing Facility, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the governments of Burkina Faso, Comoros, Liberia, and Malawi. We all know that although cervical cancer is a preventable disease, yet it remains the most common cause of deaths in the African region. In Africa, between 30 and 43 out of every 100,000 women are diagnosed with cervical cancer every year. In contrast, 7 out of every 100,000 women being diagnosed with cervical cancer in developed countries. Ladies and gentlemen, given this picture, Cervical cancer elimination remains a key priority for African First Ladies. Thus, its inclusion in the current Organization of African First Ladies for Development, WAFLOD strategic plan, where it is one of the focus areas under the NCD pillar. Secondly, during July this year, the Global First Ladies Alliance organized a capacity building session for the WAFLOD at Columbia University, where cervical cancer was a topic under discussion. Furthermore, as African First Ladies, we have launched the unifying campaign where we call for gender equality and equity across several themes, including health. And this includes cervical cancer. It is simple. As First Ladies, we are saying we are equal. Our health care should be too. Distinguished guests, it is my pleasure to share that the government of Botswana has also joined the global community in its concerted efforts to eliminate cervical cancer. This is in line with the WHO cervical cancer elimination strategy. The Ministry of Health appointed me the ambassador for the National Cervical Cancer Prevention Program campaign with the hashtag screen for life my key role being to engage gatekeepers in order to lobby their buy-in and create general public awareness. It is envisaged that this initiative will result in increased uptake of cervical cancer prevention services. The campaign will mobilize political and traditional leadership, faith-based organizations, civil society organizations, women's groups, and the media to participate in the screening and treatment campaigns. Let me share with you that just this past Friday at an event, Uniting for Cervical Cancer Elimination, hosted by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Greta Marshall Trust, I had an opportunity to interact with cervical cancer survivors, including activists from African countries. At this session, we appreciated the survivor stories where they narrated their challenging journeys. From my side as mother of the nation, I continued to give them hope and encouragement, urging them to use their power of self-advocacy from which they and other cancer sufferers stand to gain. It was evident from the interaction that inclusion of survivors forms an integral part of the fight against cancers as they share their lived experiences. The health and well-being of women is the well-being of our nations. We also know that more than 90% of the cancers caused by HPV could be prevented. However, only 25 countries on the continent have introduced HPV vaccines to their national immunization programs. Coverage rate for two doses of HPV vaccine among girls in the African region in 2021 was still at 21%. Similar to African countries, cervical cancer is the leading cause of cancer morbidity at 27.4% and mortality at 11.7% in Botswana. 
The high prevalence rate is of particular concern because women who are HIV positive are six times more likely to develop cervical cancer. With regards to vaccination, Botswana has made significant progress in an effort to eliminate cervical cancer through targeted vaccination campaigns. The HPV vaccine coverage has been above 90% until 2019 when there was a decline, when we started experiencing supply challenges in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. Besides low uptake of the HPV vaccination, a myriad of other challenges, very similar across our countries, which contribute to the high incidence rates. These include supply chain disruptions, limited access to radiography services, limited number of oncology experts, women presenting late, all leading to poor treatment outcomes. These challenges not only exist in most of our countries, but they are also known now, far more than ever. This is the time to act in order to save our women and girls. No doubt, the highest burden of cervical cancer resides right here in Africa. As I close, let me urge member states, all attendees here, to join efforts in the elimination of cervical cancer to have a cancer-free Africa region by 2030. Only through our concerted efforts can this be achieved, noting that time is not on our side as the world faces the added challenge of recovery from COVID-19. In order to achieve the WHO 90-70-90 targets, our most urgent and combined efforts need to be accelerated. Who can do it? Let us do this together as member states, international organizations, civil society organizations, the private sector, philanthropists, academia, survivors, and other stakeholders. How can we do it? by leveraging on each other's successes and harnessing synergies, doing away with silos, what then needs to be modified? Using unconventional ways of messages, governments to allocate budgets, engage in technology, strengthen community interventions so they too feel they are a part of national health goals. Above all, it requires deliberate and focused commitment at all levels. This side event affords all of us the perfect opportunity to renew our urgent commitment as a collective while also noting the lessons learned. I also wish to thank WHO for their continued technical guidance and support to African countries as they assist our countries achieve health outcomes as per the stipulated sustainable development goals. Distinguished guests, one more time, I welcome you to the side event as you share your technical expertise from across the continent. We appreciate that all these efforts are intended to ensure that our nations achieve the 90, 70, 90 targets for 2030. I thank you all for your attention. Thank you. And with thanks to Her Excellency, Mrs. Masisi, First Lady of Botswana, who, as you heard, attended that meeting with survivors and activists last week. Um, it's my great pleasure to invite an, yet another eminent person who attended that meeting, showing the level of personal commitment to this struggle to eliminate cervical cancer. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Moeti, World Health Organization Regional Director for Africa, to make some opening remarks for us. Dr. Moeti. Thank you very much, Theo. And I'd like to wish a good evening to, first of all, our First Lady, wherever she may be. I'd like to say hello to her and thank her for her really inspiring statements. I think we all agree we're seeing leadership and commitment in action in her. And welcome everybody else who is here, the Honorable Ministers of uh, Malawi, Liberia, Burkina Faso, and uh, the Comoros, as, um, as well as our partners 
who are here as well from UNICEF, UNITAID, the Global Financing Facility, Gavi, Teal Sisters, and uh, the Government of Norway, of course, the Grasa Marshall Trust, um, Bill, and the Bill and Melinda Gates, my good friend Chris Elias. I'd very importantly like to greet all the other ministers, delegates, partners, colleagues, uh, women survivors, young people, colleagues from the media who have joined us for this very important session. I have to say, it's been a very intense week for me, and this is just about the only session for which I would be still on my feet. So it's good that the program was scheduled in this way. We're here this evening to talk about how we can come together to accelerate progress towards cervical cancer elimination in the WHO African region. I'm really pleased to be part of this conversation. Last week, I attended a meeting of cancer survivors, and our colleague Karen was one of the survivors who shared their experiences with us. I was deeply touched by the accounts of the experiences that they've had. They were powerful, they were authentic, and they were inspiring. And most of all, they were filled with determination to use their own experience, use the pain that they had suffered, use the difficulties that they'd encountered, the lessons that they learned navigating the systems in different countries to get access to help, to get access to treatment, and to survive, to help other women, to take action in different ways, to mobilize women, to mobilize leaders, to mobilize healthcare systems to take action against cervical cancer. I'd like to share with the ministers here that I was particularly touched by one story of a lady from Malawi, I think she was, who told the story of how having navigated her husband's unease, I suppose, anger, to discover that his wife had this illness, she could not bear him children, she had sought care herself. She'd understood after trying a few times that in order to get access to a clinic, she had to go to the clinic at 2 o'clock in the morning. She went to, a cl to the clinic at 2 o'clock in the morning. The queue was exhausted in a few, or the health workers felt tired or they needed to stop after a short while. She had to go back home. She decided to go to the clinic at 1 o'clock the next morning in order to get help. So hearing such a story, understanding the desperation and the depth of determination of somebody who is ready to get up and go in the middle of the night virtually to go and queue up at a clinic to receive a service underlined for me what it takes under some circumstances and this is what I believe we're gathered here to address to make sure that a woman can be confident that if she gets up early enough but not outrageously early she'll find a system ready to assist her I believe this is our common objective and in a way, responsibility that we are meeting here. We need to focus on the need to address the gaps in prevention, in screening, and cancer management to ensure that all girls and women can benefit from the game-changing interventions that are available today. This will require working together, and this will require integrating approaches from all of us and from the different parts of the health system that go to making the package of interventions that these women need, and includes urgent upscaling of HPV vaccination programs, which we know are an absolute game changer in the drive to eliminate cervical cancer. Cervical cancer reflects inequalities in global health and also gender inequality. In 2020, in the African region, 100,000 women developed cervical cancer, and about 70,000 of them died. This is 21% of the cervical cancer mortality globally. We also know that more than half of cervical cancer cases in the region occur among women living with HIV, who are six times more likely to develop cervical cancer. These stark numbers are testament to the in inequity in access to vaccination, to screening, to diagnosis and treatment that is driving this high burden. 
We certainly know that the region is not yet on track towards achieving the 90-70-90 target set out in the global strategy. In 2021, the WHO Regional Committee adopted the regional framework for implementation of the global strategy to eliminate, to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health problem in the WHO African region. This framework is a priority for us in WHO Afro, and we are determined to support our member states to achieve its target. So how are we going to do this? First, HPV vaccination is a very cost-effective and efficient way to prevent, to prevent cervical cancer. We need to accelerate its introduction by implementing WHO's recommendation for a single-dose vaccine schedule. Then, we have partners who are ready to support the work. Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance's HPV revitalization program that will work over the next three years to get the vaccine to 86 million adolescent girls in low and middle-income countries, easing supply constraints and introducing new lower-cost vaccine suppliers, for example. Currently, over half of the WHO member states in the region have successfully introduced HPV vaccines into their immunization schedules, delivering the first dose to 33% of girls aged 9 to 14, eight, 14 years in 2022. Of course, we then have to work with the other half of the member states, and I hope that they are accepting that it's something that is doable and are working up their determination to join those who've already taken action. The introduction of the single dose regimen will improve the numbers I've just quoted. And nine countries in the African region, Burkina Faso, Cabo Verde, Cameroon, Ethiopia, Malawi, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, and Zambia, have already announced plans to switch to single dose HPV vaccine. Thank you for taking that decision. These are encouraging achievements, but we still need to increase equitable access to HPV vaccination, particularly in West and Central Africa and those countries that are not eligible for Gavi support. WHO Afro is supporting member states to adopt and migrate to high-performance screening and treatment modalities, which includes the procurement of equipment and consumables for HPV screening as well as expanding access to the new portable devices that are used to offer women with abnormal screening results rapid and effective intervention. Second, we need to strengthen capacity for early diagnosis and treatment. The introduction of gynecologic oncology fellowships and orientation of gynecologists in simple gyne-oncology procedures has improved access to cervical cancer treatment services in Malawi, Sierra Leone, and Zambia. In Kenya, WHO supported the implementation of community-based HPV DNA testing through self-sampling facilitated by community health workers, ensuring that women are able to access screening for cervical cancer without needing to travel to larger centers, and certainly without needing to go to the clinic at 1 a.m. The introduction of rapid HPV DNA testing at primary health care facilities in Malawi also reduce the number of patients that are lost to follow up. WHO in the African region is providing technical and financial support for the integration of cervical cancer screening and treatment services into sexual and reproductive health and rights in member states, including as part of HIV programs, as has happened in Zambia. Liberia opened its first two cervical cancer screening clinics in the public sector in 2022 with support from WHO. Thirdly, palliative care is a critical part of comprehensive cancer care, particularly in a region where, at the moment, women come late to treatment. WHO is supporting countries to strengthen decentralization of palliative care services, improving access. And Benang and Burkina Faso are two countries where palliative care programs are improving patient care. Fourth, Partnership, advocacy, including to the highest level of national leadership. And I'm very, very encouraged by the actions of our First Lady. And I'm aware that this kind of 
advocacy is happening in other countries. This advocacy and resource mobilization are vital to improving outcomes in cervical cancer and indeed all cancers in the region. We've supported five countries, Ghana, Mozambique, Tanzania, Zambia, and Zimbabwe in developing global fund proposals that are inclusive of cervical cancer. So this points to the fact that we have organizations where partnering together can make the difference in terms of access to the resources that are needed by countries to take action at scale. Additionally, we are providing ongoing support to the sub-regional training center for cervical cancer screening in Guinea. So these are just some of the examples of the possibilities that we are exploring as WHO, working with governments and working with our partners. We're also strengthening partnerships and mobilizing bilateral and multilateral donors to support investments in the prevention and control of cervical cancer. For example, together with the International Agency for Research on Cancer, IAC, three collaborative centers were launched in Cote d'Ivoire, Kenya, and South Africa to promote capacity building at national level in cancer surveillance and improve the quality of the data collected. I'd like to leave you with these key messages. First, cancer, cervical cancer can be prevented and it can be cured. Second, this requires a range of interventions from vaccines to treatment. And third, partnerships and collaboration are vital to this endeavor. I remain committed to ensuring that no woman in Africa has to receive a diagnosis of cervical cancer. We will work together to make sure this doesn't, this doesn't happen. I'm convinced that in this partnership that we are, we are engaged in today in this discussion, we can work together to eliminate cervical cancer from the African region. I thank you for having joined us here. Thank you for, com for your commitment and I'm certain that we'll be seeing each other as we work collectively to address this preventable tragedy for women. Thank you very much. And with great thanks to Dr. Moeti, who's had such a busy week, and it is such a sign of her commitment that she is still with us um, for this side event. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce Ms. Karen Nakawala, who is the CEO of Teal Sisters. Karen. Thank you. Can you hear my heart? Ladies and gentlemen, a very good evening. My name is Karen Nakawala, and I am a cervical cancer survivor. I am also an activist, and I'm representing the many survivors that could not be here today, but were with us last, last week from across the continent. And I'm here because cervical cancer can be treated if it is caught early, and one can go on living a, a productive and normal life. I'm here because cervical cancer should not be a disease of shame. And we should not allow it to strip our women of their integrity and dignity. But I'm here because it is a human rights issue and it needs our urgent attention. Now, after my treatment, the first thing that I wanted to do was to get my nine-year-old vaccinated. And we walked into the health center and the nurse told us, she was too young. I tried to plead with her, but she stood her ground because she had guidelines to follow. She's 13 and still is waiting to be vaccinated. 27 countries in Africa have rolled out the vaccination program, but the uptake is still very, very low. And I have just given you one of the reasons why that is. I also embarked on an awareness campaign to have women screened. But I will tell you, it is a nightmare to be diagnosed with cervical cancer because in some countries, women have to wait for two years, if not more, to be on treatment. She's in pain. There's no medication to relieve that pain. 
And even if the cancer is found early, because there is no treatment, she waits to die. So for many to be alive and to survive after a cancer diagnosis like myself, in this continent, it is nothing short of a miracle. When you're found with cancer, most have to travel to have tests done, and sometimes they wait for months for the results to be ready. But guess what? The cancer does not stop growing because she has to wait for the results. It keeps on growing. Only 27 countries have radiation in the region, and in some it's under the private sector, and without medical insurance, the out-of-pocket spending is catastrophic. Now, for that rural woman who is the custodian of our social norms, a pillar of her community, and has no connection in government for her to be sponsored for treatment, your guess is as good as mine. She waits to die. It's as good as being on death row, and that shouldn't be the case. For those countries that have the equipment, it's a case of either their malfunctioning or an availability of skilled staff. So why should a woman go for an HPV test only to be told to come back another day to get her results? And how many women actually go back to get those results? Why can't she get the results in one visit? And don't forget that that cost is anything from $20 to $50, even more in some areas. And so how many can actually afford this when most of them leave on under a dollar a day? About the HPV, most equipment used, like the Gene X part, put priority on TB and HIV. And I'd like someone to tell me why I should be treated according to the disease priority. We need to stop levels of the disease if we are to get anywhere. 19 out of 20 countries with the highest burden of cervical cancer are in the Africa region, but no country is on track yet to elimination. In 2020 alone, we had over 70,000 deaths. And we all know that we have very poor data collection. So that number is obviously much, much higher than is reported. The World Health Organization launched the elimination strategy in 2020. And as a survivor and activist, that gave me hope that finally we will be read of this cancer. We are going to be celebrating the third anniversary in a couple of months. And my question to all of you is, what has Africa done? What has your country done? Ladies and gentlemen, cervical cancer is a disease of iniquity and it needs our agent attention. It is a huge economic cost to families and to governments and it makes the universal health coverage that we're all talking about sound like a song. And going forward, we must recommit the 1970-90 strategy by one, making sure that the cost for the vaccines and HPV testing are made affordable and readily available on demand to all. We may not see the results now of the vaccines, but in 10 to 15 years time, that one vaccine is all the difference that we need. For those with existing but weak health systems, let us strengthen them so that women don't have to go back and forth for screening and for results. Let us screen and treat if possible. And three, let's work towards having treatment available for those found with invasive cancer so that they are treated within the shortest possible time for good treatment outcomes and survival rates. A woman should not be disadvantaged because of her geographical location. That should not be the case. To the donor community, I stand here with the lived experience whilst you have the resources. And I speak for that African woman who walked this journey, survived it, and decided to use her pain to save a life using her own meager resources. 
equip us to be agents of change. If you want to see different and positive results, you have to change the way you have been doing things. The survivors are ready to work with you towards elimination because we are qualified by experience. I look forward to hearing what each country has done so far. And in the next gathering, I want to hear of the progress made so far. You all made a commitment, ladies and gentlemen. So enough of us meeting to discuss what needs to be done. Enough of us treating cervical cancer as an afterthought and having it as a small component in a huge HIV and AIDS fund or grant. Enough of us prioritizing profit over the health of a woman's life. Enough. If the thought of losing a woman every second minute angers you as much as it angers me, ladies and gentlemen, now is the time to work. I thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Um, and now we're going to take some brief remarks from our other panelists. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome the Honorable Kumbize Kandodo Chiponda, the Minister of Health of Malawi. I know it's very hard to follow that kind of <laughs> speech, but I also know that you have made it a great priority to get the cervical cancer elimination strategy up and ready. So I hand over for your remarks. Thank you so much, our moderator, our fellow panelists. In the interest of time, uh, all protocols observed. Uh, it is a great honor this evening to be part of this panel, uh, especially on this very important discussion uh, to do with the cervical uh, cancer. Cervical cancer is the fourth most common cancer among women in the world, and 90% of the cervical cancer-related deaths occur in Africa. Malawi has the highest mortality rate of cervical cancer-related deaths in the world, with 51 deaths per 100,000 people every year. This is seven times higher than the global rate. Every year, Malawi registers about 3,600 new cases of cervical cancer, and of these, over 2,000, they die. As such, any attempt aimed at building a foundation for cervical cancer free Africa is a welcome development to Malawi. Malawi successfully piloted a school class-based HPV vaccination program between 2013 and 2016 in an attempt to fight the disease. The program targeted the in-school girls aged 19 years. And for the out-of-school girls, a healthy facility-based approach was used. In 2019, the Ministry of Health, with support from development partners, rolled out the vaccination program across the country. This was a two-dose vaccination program with a second dose coming after one year period. The program was a success as over 80% of the targeted population was reached. However, the multiple dose vaccination programs have follow-up bottlenecks. The pilot program in the country had a 7.7% overall dropout compromising the full immunization drive. The repetition of the process also requires more resource utilization. And for a country like Malawi, whose per capita expenditure on health is far below the recommended WHO recommendation, such that repetitions are detrimental to health system efficiencies. Malawi welcomes the single dose paradigm shift as it will save healthcare inputs that are used to repeat the immunization campaigns. Malawi also adopted the multi-sector approach in the HPV vaccination program. The ministers of health and education, we work together to capture the girls in school and also the girls out of school. Considering that the targeted age for the vaccine is school going, the collaboration is helping to increase the coverage. The approach can also be adopted for the screening and treatment of cervical cancer. There are several platforms which the continent can explore in a multi-sectoral approach for diagnosing as well as treatment. The continent has a cross-section of cultural events which may also provide a good base 
for health services delivery. On the uptake of the new innovative technologies for screening and treatment of cervical cancer, Malawi and indeed most of African countries, we lack a capacity to develop such technologies for screening and treating cervical cancer. We rely on the development partners to have access to such technologies. For example, in Malawi, HBV vaccination is supported by the Medicines Sand Frontiers, by World Health Organization, but we're also grateful to Gavi and indeed UNICEF. And the success of the uptake is the result of the collaboration of the development partners. And this is in line with the ministry's adoption of the one plan, one budget, one report approach. The approach promotes coordination among stakeholders in a defined plan to achieve a common goal. It will therefore be great for partners to join hands to support developing countries or underdeveloped countries to have access to the modern technologies of screening and more especially diagnosing cervical cancer. But we also need infrastructure. Screening and diagnosing of cancer, we need dignified space for the women to be screened, but also to be diagnosed. We also need adequate trained personnel in our facilities for the same, for the screening as well as diagnosing and as well as for the HPV vaccination. We also need more health initiatives, global health initiatives, to include prevention and management of cervical cancer. On top of that, we need technical support, but we also need financial support. And my appeal to our, uh, our, our, our colleagues, uh, those who support us, we need conditions which are conducive, because sometimes you are offered support that you can get so much for this, for cervical cancer, but the process of having access to the money in itself, it is also a barrier. You know, it is like, you know, in the Bible, they say when you go to heaven, the road is very narrow and it's wide, the, the door is very, very small. Some of the conditions for us to access the funds which are available there, it is like that. So we are appealing to come up with conducive, you know, conditions so that as member states, we can have access uh, to uh, these funds in order for us you know, to help our women who are indeed uh, suffering day in, day out. I thank you so much for giving me this space. Thank you so much for your comments and for that very vivid reminder of some of the obstacles that are put in the way for uh, uh, mobilizing resources. And now it's my pleasure to hand over to Dr. Wilhelmina Jala, Ministry of Health of Liberia, I know you have many lessons that you can share with us from the experience you've already had with your rollout. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Please allow me to stand on the existing protocol. Liberia has a population of approximately 5.3 million people where women make up close to 50% of that number and 40% of, of the women are 15 years uh, uh, under 15 years old. Based on this statistic, we estimate that roughly 800,000 women are at risk for developing cervical cancer. According to the Global, global Crown, cervical cancer makes up 18.5% of all the cancers in Liberia. Almost all are HPV related. The average age of quotas for Girls is around 17 years old, and this makes them exposed to HPV. We all know that Liberia have been through a lot of challenges, infrastructure, or from the civil war, the Ebola, as well as the COVID. So pathology was not available until 2019. Based on the pathology lab that was set up, cervical cancer affects, is the cancer that affects most women when they get all of the pathology reports. And the average age that a woman will get cervical cancer, they have noticed, is around 50 years old. Now, I'm so glad that now we have a target, something that we can follow, 90, 70, 90, which is good. It gives us hope to be able to have solution to our problem. Let's look at our first 90. 
Luckily for us, in 2019, we launched a two-dose HPV vaccine to our routine immunization. The age group that we were targeting were nine years old. By 2023, June, the HPV one-dose vaccine were at 91 percent, and the two doses were at 61 percent. So that made us go back to think, and we were able to apply to Gavi to say that we want to switch to the one dose vaccine, and we want to up the age to nine to 14 years old, so that we can make that 90 target by 2030. Now, if we look at the 70 uh, 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 for screening, uh, we have been doing a lot of piloting. We piloted the VIA model with acetic assay and treated with cryotherapy. WHO were able to help us to, to launch another model in the hospital facility where we were supposed to be screening 15,000 women. But unfortunately, the first project uh, at the first hospital did not take off very well, so we have to restart that. But the second hospital were only able to screen during the COVID time 79 women, of which 22 of them were positive. So with that, as we relaunch those two programs, we are looking at, we applied for another grant with the CIFA project, and we were accepted where we'll be able to do the self-collecting HPV, HPV screening, and we'll be able to use the existing gene expert machine that we have in every county. And instead of just using it for HIV, TB, and other things, we can now use those machines to be effective at all the different uh, facilities. The only problem is, the gene expert cartridge for the machine is very expensive. So we hope that we can rely on international partners to help us bargain for lower cost HPV cartridge to accelerate our cervical cancer screening and make it more affordable. Now, if we look at the last 90, we will see that that one has been giving us a lot of difficulty. From the program, we were able to treat with thermocoagulation cryotherapy. We have two oncologists, uh, GYN oncologists, that have returned to Liberia, and so they have been doing a lot of surgery, or, or, or gynecological oncology surgery. We have scattered chemotherapy, but really the, the main stay of care for this disease is the the radiotherapy. So we are working with the IAEA to be able to provide us with a radiotherapy uh, 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 facility, and we're hoping that we get accepted. They said the board have to meet, so we always have to wait for boards. The board have to meet, and maybe we, our proposal will be accepted for us to be able to get the cryo, I mean, to get the, the uh, radiotherapy uh, program working where they will train uh, physicists and radiotherapy oncologists. That would be very helpful for our national program so that we will be able to reduce the cervical cancer. I see hope for the 90, 70, 90 target for Liberia as we integrate it into primary health care and we be able to get support from all of our donor partners is something that is reachable, and some of the 90s can be met before 2030. I thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Minister. And now I'd like to turn to the Honorable Robert Lucien Jean-Claude Kagugu, Minister of Health for Burkina Faso. Hello. Uh, uh, I'm going to speak French. Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator, and ladies and gentlemen, honorable ministers, heads of delegation, regional director. 
I would like to say that it is a great honor for me to be invited to share Burkina Faso's experience on uh, cervical, cervical cancer. And I would just like to say um, as an introduction that cervical cancer is the second can cancer affecting women after uh, breast cancer and the uh, deadliest one. And uh, given this situation, the government is really uh, very committed to uh, wage a battle against it and the proof of it is lies in some historical aspects that I would like to talk about uh, very quickly under the control of Madam the Regional Director to recall that the first regional conference on uh, cervical cancer uh, took place in Ouagadougou and at that conference, at that regional conference, for the very first time the discussions uh, uh, focus on the possibility of introducing the HPV vaccine in the African region. In 2010, I would also like to say that there was a consultation of experts still in Ouagadougou um, at which the first regional strategy for the fight against cervical cancer was launched. And I would just like to recall that and also say that it is really a priority for the government of Burkina Faso. That being said, very quickly, I would like to... Uh, base this presentation on the three objectives, prevention, screening, and treatment. And as far as screening uh, prevention is concerned, uh, from the point of view of governance, I would like to say that in Burkina Faso, we have um, created a national program uh, for the fight against cancer, and we also have a directorate for the control and uh, of uh, non-communicable diseases in 2018. We also have the Burkina Bay Coalition for the fight against cancer, and we have strategic plans for the fight against cancer. The first of them was uh, from 2013 to 2017, and the second one goes from 2021 to 2025. Now, as far as prevention is concerned, I would like to refer to the introduction of the vaccine, uh, HPV vaccine in the uh, extended vaccination program uh, and uh, for children from 9 to 14 years. And uh, uh, by 2022, 70% 70 of the 9-year girls benefited from the HPV vaccine. And in 2023, uh, in compliance with the new WHO guidelines, we introduced very quickly the single dose HPV dose and that uh, allowed us during this year, 2023, uh, in, uh, in the middle, in mid-year, to uh, immunize 96% of the girls between 9 and 10 years and 48% of girls um, for annual coverage, uh, by way of annual coverage, which means that we will reach our objective by the end of this year. In the domain of dépistage, I would like to now, when it comes to screening, we have a protocol for the screening of cervical cancer with national guidelines for prevention of cervical cancer, free uh, screening of pre-cancer uh, lesions since 2016 as a part of a package of free services being offered to women and uh, to um, pregnant women and children under five, because you know that every year Burkina Faso um, uh, puts 50 million US dollars in its budget for such services. I would like also to mention the use of cryotherapy, thermocoagulation, uh, and other systems in many hospital and regional centers and university hospitals in our uh, country. Now, for, from the point of view of treatment, the transition government has adopted a decision, a, a, a presidential uh, decision to ensure that radiotherapy for women suffering from cervical cancer is free of charge. And it is very important to mention that. I also wanted to mention the uh, um, uh, care in surgery and uh, um, cancer surgery, and the Burkina has a radiotherapy center which is functional in Ouagadougou. Another one will also be functional in the second half of 2024, and by the year end of 2024, by the end of the year 2024, we'll have a third center which will also be functional in the economic capital city. 
For as far as uh, the management of uh, health information is concerned, I would like to note the, the, existence, uh, the existence of a register of anatomy pathology at the center in Ouagadougou. There is a register in Ouagadougou, and we also have universities and research institutes which take care of cancer cases. Now, to move faster, I would like to share with you the perspectives that we have. We, of course, intend to extend this vaccination of, uh, to uh, girls between 11 and 14 years, from 11 to 14 years. And we are working also, we are trying not to leave out boys. The other perspective is catching up the cohort of 11 to 18-year girls that we are going to launch by the year 2024. And I would like to say that uh, when it comes to fighting cancer, the government of Burkina Faso is really committed. And uh, we are uh, relying on the state budget, but with the support of financial and technical partners, it's, of course, we should ensure that all girls can benefit from prevention and that women who unfortunately will have uh, cervical cancer for them to be also be able to benefit from treatment. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister, and for bringing in the, the breadth of the work that is being done in Burkina Faso. We now have comments from uh, Ms. Bjorg Sandka, excuse my pronunciation, <laughs> the uh, Secretary of State for International Development from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Norway. Thank you, moderator, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I didn't hear you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. You have to show you're awake. <laughs> no, because we are really here to talk about how to realize the right to help, to rectify the injustice in unequal access, in this case, to available information and services to address a key public health issue on the African continent. We've heard very compelling data. So we know that we have a huge challenge that we need to work together to address. So how do we do this? In global health, when we've come across challenges like this, we sometimes set up new initiatives to address them. But do we believe that the solution is a new cervical cancer initiative? I certainly don't. I think the discussions we've had over the past couple of days and what we've heard from the ministries of health is a clear call for us as development partners to work much better together to help and support ministries of health in addressing the challenges that you see, such as this one, in your respective countries. So the good news here is that cervical cancer is preventable and avoidable. I don't need to repeat the stories and the evidence that we've heard and the great examples from my previous panelists. And we have the tools. Now, how can we work better together to make sure that we coordinate and provide that support that ministries of health are calling for. So I'm very encouraged when I look at the list of co-conveners of this event. So you see the, the names of all of them behind me on the screen. Looking across, I think each one of them holds a piece of the solution to how we can really provide you know, that uh, level of support to address cervical cancer on the African continent that we are looking for. Let me just mention two examples. The first one from Gavi, the HPV vaccine. We know the HPV vaccine is a very cost-effective vaccine. There is enough evidence and experience from countries to know that it is possible to provide the vaccine to those who, who should get it. And now with the new one-dose regime rather than two doses, it means we can vaccinate twice as many with the same number of doses. That's really good news. The second tool that I wanted to mention is new tools to screen, to detect pre-cancerous cancerous lesions, uh, and to remove them. That has been piloted by UNITAID. So I was on the UNITAID board in 2019 when we made that decision to invest uh, in a consortium with CHAI, uh, and a consortium called the Success Consortium, to pilot new technology in seven countries to screen 
and treat uh, cervical cancer or rather precancerous lesions. We weren't sure whether how this would go. I was able to see in Senegal last year the great success and the data has now come out to show that this is now, this technology is possible to use in African health systems. And the price, again with UNITAID's negotiation, has come down to a level where it's more affordable. Other partners that co-convene this meeting will be there to help or could be there to help support with the systems that you need. And of course, learning, listening to Karen and, remind, and the lessons that we've learned from HIV, bringing in communities, because nothing about us without us. So my message here is that let's deliver on working much better together, coordinating across all of us as development partners to provide support to ministries of health uh, and others who work at country level to rectify the injustice and the unequal access to information, prevention, and treatment for cervical cancer. Thank you. Thank you very much. And our final panelist who will uh, speak from this stage is Dr. Chris Elias, President of Global Development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Thank you, Theo, and thank you, thanks everyone for being here this evening um, at the end of a long week. Um, I think the size of the crowd indicates how important this issue is. As much as the important comments that have gone from my previous panelists, the Gates Foundation is delighted to co-host this important side event to raise awareness of, of, of cervical cancer elimination. Um, it's obviously, as you've heard, an issue that demands urgent attention. You know, I think uh, I have statistics here that talk about how, you know, meeting the 90, 70, 90 goals by 2030 um, isn't, uh, isn't fortunately on track, you know, while only 10% of, of girls in lower income countries have been vaccinated against HPV, that's where 90% of the, the women who die from cervical cancer live in countries. I can't say that better than Grasha myself said last Friday when she talked about her history of advocacy for this important issue and her frustration about how many years has gone by without sufficient action. The stark inequity is why we at the Gates Foundation have been, increased our focus on improving and accelerating access to HPV vaccines as well as advocating for more equitable access to the range of of treat, screening and treatment tools, as well as palliative care, all of the three pillars of the global strategy for cervical cancer elimination. I think it's important to reflect that this is not just our usual health inequity where innovations become available in richer countries before poor. This is a very complex kind of inequality, um, inequity that manifests through a, a, a complex intersectionality it reflects the, the gender inequality that underlies so much of global health and development. And it also reflects the inequality that we've had historically in how we've designed services, where we focus very much on under five child mortality reduction, and we focus on reproductive age women to bring uh, contraceptive and other important maternal and reproductive health services. But we have systematically underserved younger people as well as older women. And I think the powerful stories that Shidi um, talked about in her uh, experience talking to the cancer survivors last Friday, and, and of course the stories that Karen provided, both from the survivors as well as her own daughter's uh, trouble accessing um, youth services to provide a vaccine at a time where many other countries are targeting nine-year-olds. Um, um, and so I think we have to really think about the broader inequity that, um, that shapes how cervical cancer is experienced by women across the world, and of course their families and communities, which are dramatically affected by what is in many countries the second or third, or in some countries the number one cause of death of women, uh, particularly women of, of reproductive age. Um, so if you think about what we have to do, it's equally complicated um, in terms of and it's an intervention just taking HPV vaccination that requires cross-sexual collaboration 
in different sectors, with imm the immunization program, obviously, but also child health, adolescent health programs, collaborations with the HIV and, and STD uh, worlds, the, the cancer prevention communities, sexual and reproductive health, as well as the education sector, where many of these youth can be reached um, through school-based uh, initiatives. And I think, as, as Bjork was just saying, I think this is a critical time for us as partners, not just to co-sponsor an event with many logos on it, but to actually make it easier for ministries of health. As our honorable colleagues, the ministers of health, talk, I was thinking about, I've never been a minister of health, and after hearing from them, I'm not sure I'd want to be because of the complexity. I mean, you know, Minister Chibanda described, used a biblical reference to talk about how narrow, winding, and, and steep the road to heaven is. The challenge for a minister trying to re secure resources and technology is that they have to go to many heavens. They have to go to Gavi for the vaccines. They may have to go to Unitaid for new diagnostics. They have to go to the Global Fund or the GFF to access support for health systems that could support the delivery of those services. They have to negotiate with private sectors that are used to dealing with other specific diseases like HIV and TB and are just discovering cervical cancer as our our, 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 our colleague from Liberia described. So I think we need to make that pathway, if not to heaven, at least the pathway to the development assistance that we as a development community can provide a little bit wider, flatter, and easier to traverse. Um, and so the foundation is going to be part of that. We're, we're very happy to partner with Gavi on the, on the vaccine access and and, and with Unitaid and, and all of the other uh, global health initiatives to try and come up with an easier system for ministers like those on the panel today to address a very complex multi-sectoral pro problem with a less fragmented and easier to deal with infrastructure and architecture. Because um, if we don't, we're gonna be failing the women and girls um, that, that are, are that we've advocated for since the launch of the global strategy back in, in 2020. There are additional resources in each of those global health initiatives that are relevant to this. They all have a piece to play, but none of them owns the mandate for the full spectrum of all three pillars of the cervical cancer elimination strategy. So it's incumbent upon countries as well as development partners to coordinate it in an exceptional way. And I think that's the challenge before us, and it's a challenge I think we can meet. Science is helping us. New, new diagnostic technologies are becoming available and more affordable. The, the WHO uh, SAGE recommendation for a single dose, which as Sheedy listed, has been already um, uh, uh, adopted by 10 countries in this region and, and by many other countries around the world, including um, many high-income countries such as, as Australia. So I think there's a tremendous amount of momentum here. Um, and I think we can leave this regional committee with uh, realizing that momentum, and I would just, you know, right before the World Health Assembly this year in Geneva, um, there was a, a, a meeting of health professionals and advocates who launched the Global Declaration to Eliminate Cervical Cancer, calling for urgent action to cervical cancer elimination as a global priority. It's already been signed by 2,000 uh, people across 130 countries, uh, and more than 700 of those signatories are here on the African continent. And today, I want to invite get more. So if you, this is the card with the QR code. It's got, I think it's on your shares. Um, you can uh, sign up for the delegation, out, the declaration outside on the way out. If you need an additional incentive, I think you can get a cervical cancer notebook by doing that. But that's not a good reason to sign the declaration. The reasons have been given by the powerful voices of the people on this panel. So I'm convinced that if we work together, we're going to be able to meet the ambitious goals of the 90, 70, 90 by 2030, or ideally sometime sooner. Because as, as, as uh, Karen was saying, lives are in the balance, cancer doesn't wait, and we shouldn't wait either. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Dr. Um, Sufudin, we haven't forgotten about you, but before we come to you to, for the close of the meeting, we'd like to first of all invite some of the partners who, whose names you've heard mentioned along this panel um, to talk a little bit about what they're doing and give that information, which is so very important when countries are looking for resources to support these efforts. 
And if there are other people who would like to make comments and would like to join in, please raise um, your name tags so that we can see. Um, please forgive me if I don't see everyone. I've got people looking. Um, and we will also come to you. I'd like everybody to try and limit their comments to just two minutes so that we can actually get as many comments in as possible. And I'm sure you will want that to happen because after we've finished in this room, we will be having a reception um, outside in the hallway. And at that reception, we will have tables for the different partners, Gavi, Unitaid, um, UNICEF, etc., so that you can continue your conversations and ask more questions. And so, to begin, I'd like to call on Ms. Chioma Nwachukwu um, from Gavi to respond to some of the things that you've heard this evening. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, Your Excellency, distinguished guests, Thank you to WHO Africa Regional Office for organizing this side event on building a foundation of Africa Free along with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Grass MSL Trust, UNICEF, Unit Aid Gavi, and the Global Finance Facility, as well as the governments of Comoros, Malawi, and, um, and Liberia. Allow me to start by thanking the more than 20 African countries that have already introduced the HPV vaccine. This is a show of collective efforts and commitment to protect adolescent girls' health by guaranteeing them access to the HPV vaccine, which, as we know, prevents up to 95% of cervical cancer cases. We're at a unique moment in time where we can revitalize efforts, as we've heard from the panelists, to reach adolescent girls with the HPV vaccine, especially now when the vaccine looks to be more accessible than ever before. We've heard about the single-dose regimen advised by WHO SAGE, increased supply, we have new entrants to the HPV vaccine market. These all provide unique opportunities for us to build upon. Gavi's revitalization program has an ambitious target of reaching more than 86 million adolescent girls with the HPV vaccine by 2025, with the aim of averting 1.4 million future deaths from cervical cancer. But in order to be sustainably, in order to sustainably ensure adolescent girls are reached now and in the future, we must collectively work together around critical areas, and some of this we've heard um, thus far. Recognition that the, at the core of protecting adolescents from cervical cancer is stronger coordination through strengthening linkages across sectors, as well as influencing and informing social norms to recognize and prioritize adolescent health. Secondly, we must centralize adolescent health and offer a package of care for adolescent girls while recognizing their role as future caregivers and adults, spreading positive health messages and ensuring their access to health care now, not tomorrow, but now. As an adolescent-focused program, it uniquely plays a role in leveling the prioritization of adolescents' health through women and girls' access to preventive health care and opportunities to work closely with the education sector, thereby requiring policy alignment, policy decisions that impact positively on the program. The other area that we want to share from Gavi is that young adolescents have fewer touch points with their health systems, and therefore cervical cancer's preventive program could be a platform to allow integrated package of care. For example, menstrual hygiene, malaria, sexual reproductive health um, rights and programs, nutrition and non-health areas, and of course nutrition, which will help increase health system efficiency and reduce costs. One thing we want to say is that we have a lot of the knowledge and the tools. We can do that now. And as Gavi and the Alliance partners, we remain committed and ready to continue to work alongside the countries in our collective efforts to protect the health of adolescent girls across the continent. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Um, I'd now like to, I'm going to call a few of the partners first and then come back to some of our um, health delegations from different countries so that you can have something um, from them to respond to. So the next person I'd like to call is Mr. Robert Matiru um, from UNITAID. Thank you very much uh, to the WHO Africa Regional Office for allowing us co-hosts to have this really important side event. 
distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. With more than $75 million invested since 2019, Unitaid to date is the largest funder of innovative tools to fund and treat women with pre-cancer living in low and middle income countries. This investment uh, followed the call to action for cervical cancer elimination that was issued by WHO in 2018 and has laid the groundwork for national cancer elimination programs in 14 countries across three contents and in a range of contexts. I wanted to say that guided by the priorities and support of our partner governments in those 14 countries, with our implementing partners and WHO, at the end of 2022, we reached a really important milestone. We achieved the screening of 1.1 million women uh, with services for cervical cancer in countries in Africa, predominantly, but also Asia and Latin America. And more of a third of these women received a high-performance screening solution, an HPV PCR test. And we also rolled out 6,000 thermal ablation devices in centers of health in 30 different countries. And we did this, as you heard from the Secretary of State from Norway, while reducing the cost of HPV screening by 30% and thermal ablation devices by 50%, making it 10 times cheaper than an inferior health product, which is cryotherapy. So these figures are much more than just encouraging. The national programs we've been working with have been achieving and exceeding the target of 90% by for the, set by the elimination strategy and demonstrating once again that the tools and interventions recommended by WHO are appropriate and that we're on the right track uh, to the response to cervical cancer. Innovative and affordable screen and treat strategies do exist. They are feasible and cost effective and if replicated widely can avert progression for millions of women to, ca to cancer. So we really want to emphasize that by coupling screen and treat programs uh, for precancerous lesions with HPV vaccination efforts and tertiary care, cervical cancer elimination is an achievable goal. It's not a chimera, it's not an illusion. We know that challenging times lie ahead and health systems are still recovering and reinventing from the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. And that's why we need, and you heard this from each of our panelists, a concerted effort of all partners and governments to understand how to resolve the health financing agenda to drive this effort forward. And we need to be creative about where we find that money. We can't say the financing is not there. We don't have a global fund for cervical cancer, but we do have a global fund for HIV, TB, and malaria. And I want to applaud uh, uh, Minister Chiponda and her team who put in a strong global fund proposal in this next financing cycle that emphasized in detail how they could tap into the resilient and sustainable health systems financing stream, which has hundreds of millions of dollars in it, for HIV screening on multiplex platforms in her country. Many other governments can do this, and we've worked with several to try and build strong proposals, not just for the Global Fund. We have development banks, we have foundations, we have the partners listed up there, including Unitaid, who stand ready to, in a concerted way, drive this agenda moving forward. And the resources we have aren't enough, but we have resources, and we can show with this momentum how to crowd in even more resourcing. So thank you once again for uh, us having this opportunity to showcase what can be done so that the excuse that it can't be done is no longer viable. Thank you. Thank you. And, and now I'd like to call on Dr. Joan Mati, the Botswana country representative for UNICEF. Honorable ministers, ladies and gentlemen, UNICEF as a co-host of this session would like to commend WHO AFRO for organizing this important high-level event on cancer elimination in Africa. This reaffirms its commitment to join partners in, re in again committing themselves to the prevention, control, and elimination of cervical cancer in Africa. UNICEF recognizes the leadership of Her Excellency Mrs. Nell Jane Masisi, the First Lady of Botswana, for her commitment to children, youth, and women's health and well-being. We commend her leadership in making access to HPV vaccination a priority and to, to reduce the risk of cervical cancer amongst women and girls in Botswana and for in, inspiring other African First Ladies to do so, as she so well articulated earlier this evening. UNICEF renews its commitment as a member of the Gavi Alliance to further support member states in relaunching the HPV vaccination agenda. To this end, the UNICEF Executive Director, Ms. Catherine Russell, is fully committed 
and has earmarked substantial UNICEF core resources to support the scale-up and coverage of HPV vaccination across different country contexts and in the development and humanitarian settings as well. Throughout the WHO RC73 meeting, we have continuously heard about the importance of multisectoral programming. I think this has been reiterated as well again this evening. UNICEF continues to be committed to leverage its comparative advantage of working across multiple sectors, WASH, education, protection, nutrition, and to ensure that the issues around cancer, uh, cervical cancer prevention, are at the center of these multi-sectoral um, uh, platforms. In addition, UNICEF will continue to leverage partnerships for stronger political advocacy for critical investment in the health of adolescent girls. UNICEF will also continue to support the procurement and supply of HPV vaccines, the adaptation of guidelines, and the development of context-specific demand creation. The issue of the centrality of communities, families, and households in the prevention of cancer has been highlighted again this evening. And of course, this can be addressed very effectively through social and behavioral change programs that will help to build vaccine confidence and address gender-related barriers under the leadership of ministries of health and indeed other sectors in the social domains, thus making cervical cancer history on the continent before, and I repeat, before 2030. I thank you for your attention. Thank you. And just before I turn to the countries, I'd like to invite um, Mr. Ernest Masia from the World Bank. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Moderator, and also sincere thanks to WHO Afro for organizing this meeting. But also, too, I'd like to thank the country delegations that at 13 minutes past eight are still here listening to this topic, given the importance of this for us on the continent. Um, I'd like to have my comments perhaps on two areas. The first is on alignment, and the second is on adolescent health. But before that, I'm really struck by a comment that was made at the opening in terms of Gratian Michelle's concern that after 15 years, we hadn't seen sufficient progress. And then the subsequent discussions on the inequality of what we're seeing for cervical cancer, but broadening that into inequalities as we look at women's health in Africa. And I questioned and asked myself, if 15 years ago a vaccine had been found that could address something for men, would we be having the same discussion at this point in time, or would we have seen much more progress? And how do we address those inequalities that affect women's health and women's reproductive health? But on alignment, let me speak to what we in the World Bank are looking to do and with our colleagues in the uh, Global Financing Facility. The first is really to pull together the work that is done, not just with our health sector, but with our education sector, but also our social protection sector. Because we need to find the girls, not just who are in school, but the girls who are out of school. And where are the social registries that will help us be able to identify that population? And also, too, with our gender colleagues and with our community engagement. And I want to say, Karen, I heard the heart and we need to make sure that we have that in the work that we do as we go forward. But how then, within this agenda, do we use the comparative advantages of an institution like the World Bank? Many of you will think of us simply from our lending, but there are two other functions that are important. One is how are we able to convene, and in particular, how do we convene ministers of finance, because the sustainability of these efforts is going to be important. So how do we make sure that they are aware of what are the challenges for financing, what are the options for addressing those challenges, and how do we move forward in that. So we're looking to see how we convene ministers of finance, working with ministers of health and education to advance this agenda. And the second is the knowledge agenda. What new information do we need to bring to our member states, to our ministries of finance, about what are the options for moving forward with cervical cancer? But that alignment also, too, is one where, and I've heard from members on the panel, making sure that all partners are able to share in a transparent way 
what is available in terms of funding, but also innovations, so that ministers have at their disposal not to go partner by partner, but are able to understand the totality of what is available for them in their country. Let me end on the adolescent health agenda. I think if we are able to get to that young girl who is out of school and all we are able to do is give her one dose of a vaccine, we've missed the market. We've missed the opportunity to really expand on an adolescent health agenda for young girls, but also including young boys. And that's an agenda that has been missing in a lot of our global development. And I think, Chris, you were very articulate in that. But I, I wonder sometimes, we're very good at zero to five, but if you're five and six months, we don't have the data for you in the health sector. We need to make sure that that gap that we've traditionally had with young people is addressed and covered, and we are able then to move forward with a more holistic approach for health for young people, young women in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. I'm now going to take some comments from the floor. We only have about 15 minutes left, so um, please can um, people try and limit their comments to just a couple of minutes. Um, I'd like to first call the delegation from Zambia. Cervical cancer in Zambia is the most common cancer in Zambia and it accounts for approximately 23% of all cancer cases. It's therefore a big public health problem. Some reports indicate that the incidence of cervical cancer, which is one of the highest in the world, is around 65.5 per 100,000, with the corresponding mortality rate of 43.4% per 100,000 in women. Zambian government has recognized this problem as instituted measures in line with, with WHO cervical cancer elimination in, initiatives to reduce the incidence and mortality rate from this disease. In this regard, our country has embarked on a comprehensive approach to address the three main pillars, prevention, screening, and treatment of precancerous lesion and management of invasive cancer, cervical cancer. These are being implemented simultaneously, and at a scale, we have committed to reach the 90, 70, 90 targets towards the strategy to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer by 2030. To reach, this, to reach the elimination effort, Zambia has accelerated 90% coverage of HPV vaccination for girls between 9 and 15 years. The HPV a normal program was introduced in 2019 for 14 and 15 years girls with the initial coverage of 75%. This was dramatically affected by the COVID-19 pandemic, but we have made progress towards the recovery of 71% of one dose and 41% of dose two in 2022. With the vaccination program now fully integrated into the normal routine vaccination schedule, we are set to implement the HPV multiple age current vaccination this September, targeting girls from 9 to 14 years old. We are using a multi sectoral approach with full engagement of all key stakeholders and sectors as Ministry of Education and local government. The elimination agenda includes the expansion of service for treatment of cervical cancer, pre-cancer restriction, which currently is at 80%. Local training of specialized for management of both <coughs> cervical, or surgical and non-surgical treatment of cervical cancer is in progress, and pathology services have been enhanced to match the growth demand. In addition, we have launched a palliative care strategic plan in March 2022, and we have completed the National Cancer Control Strategic Plan for 2022 to 2026. The programs M and E has been enlightened and researched into robust province referrals and and pathways through provincial multidiscipline team has been conducted. Lastly, Zambia ratified its commitment to the global strategy to accelerate the elimination 
of cervical cancer. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, delegation from Zambia. Um, if I could move on to the Republic of Tanzania. Okay, if, if Tanzania is no longer here, could I uh, move to... The, oh? the government of Tanzania oh. uh, commends and reaffirms its commitment to eliminate cervical cancer and, uh, as a public health uh, problem. The government of Tanzania is cognizant of the fact that cancer is a public health problem and a leading cause of cancer-related death among women uh, in the developing world. Our country ranks fifth in the burden of this disease. Uh, Madam Chair, commencing in 2010, the government of Tanzania established the National Cervical Cancer Program in line with the health sector strategic plan, which led to uh, development of the first and the second National Cervical Cancer Prevention and Control Strategy 2020-2024. These documents reaffirm national commitment on a global call for action to accelerate the elimination of cervical cancer as a public health challenge by 2030. Tanzania would like to share with you its expansion of services, coverage of cervical cancer screening, which currently stands at 47% in the primary level. And from this uh, facilities, uh, we have trained the staff to screen and treat precancerous lesions, installed medical equipment and supplies. In three years, we have managed to reach around 40% of illegal population for the screening of the services. At the same, the government of Tanzania is, is increasing its capability by, by putting in place infrastructures for H, HPV DNA testing, which is expected to start uh, to work in January 2024. Madam Chair, in 2018, the government of Tanzania launched the primary prevention of cervical cancer by starting giving HPV vaccine for girls aged 14. Currently, the, gov the government is planning to switch vaccination targets from the age of 14 to 9 years and switch from double, uh, double to single dose as per WHO recommendation. Just to share some of the results on the vaccination, uh, in 2019, we managed to reach 81% of the eligible populations uh, with HPV-1, and the second dose was 49% coverage. While in 2022, last year, we managed to reach 80% for the first dose of vaccination and 61% for the second dose of vaccination. So we think as a country, if we switch to uh, one dose, we are likely to have a huge coverage of the eligible population. Madam Chair, I would like you to finish by saying that uh, the government of Tanzania again reaffirms its commitment to eliminate cervical cancer as a public health problem, though additional investment is needed to enhance availability of adequate resources to scale up to the, to the number of health facilities capable of providing screening services from 47 to 80 percent by 2025 to procure supplies for HPV uh, uh, DNA testing and making available medical equipment for screening and treatment and procure more HPV vaccines. I submit. Thank you. Um, can I please ask people to try and keep their comments very brief? We only have time for maybe three more interventions. Um, I call upon Senegal. Your Excellency, First Lady of Botswana, you have the greatest uh, the thanks of the First Lady of Senegal for all your work in, on cervical cancer. In Senegal, management of this uh, cancer is a major priority and strategies have been implemented in collaboration with the national uh, plan on cervical cancer, but we're also aligned to the acceleration of uh, elimination of cervical cancer by the WHO by 2030. So, 
sensitization com and communication activities to inform on screening and on vaccination of girls has been carried out. A manual was carried out to further educate them. And we are using leaders and uh, professionals of traditional medicine. We also use community actors and television to inform on the disease and also to, for early screening. In Senegal, for vaccination of girls against HPV for girls 8, 19 to 9 to 14 is in the expanded immunization program all over the country. This is with the support of the uh, Ministry of Education. There is also decentralization of screening in the major health centers. The screening and treatment units for the lesions were set up in 71 health facilities, and some of them have high-performing equipment. On treatment today, we have sub, sub, we subsidize chemotherapy to the tune of one billion CSP francs, so that we can have free chemotherapy for treatment of cervical and breast cancer. We also provide 40 to 60 percent subsidy for other cancers. In the budget of 2023, we had an increase of 500 million CFA francs. We continue to lobby for more. We, uh, we now have the machines in Tuba, the major religious center. So, in terms of prospects, today we are building the major oncology center in Jamnajo which will be a center of excellence for this purpose. And finally, on data management, out of our, nine reg out of our 14 regions, we have nine who, that have registers. And we are having data, effective data entry. By the end of the year, we hope that the entire country will be covered. In conclusion, I'd like to further thank UNITED that has been working with us with the funds from Bill and Melinda Gates uh, Foundation and for Gavi also, which helped us to come up with a private pilot project that has given concrete results on screening. And with the work alongside uh, the uh, tuberculosis program, we have, we have a good example of integration. Thank you. I'd call Nigeria. Thank you, Madam Chair. I sincerely align with the well-established protocol. As we eagerly await the forthcoming 2023 International Concert Week in October, Nigeria has finalized a groundbreaking national strategy plan for prevention and control of cancer of cervix spanning from 2023 to 2027. One of the cornerstones of this strategic plan revolves around a visionary strategy to meet the ambitious 2030 deadline for eliminating cervical cancer. This approach involves the vaccination of young girls aged 9 to 14 with HPV vaccine before their sexual debut. This vaccination initiative is poised to become an integral part of our national healthcare uh, landscape as it is set to be officially launched on 25th to 29th September 2023 for the first phase targeting 16 states with a population of 7,766,683 uh, adolescents. Notably, the HPV vaccines inclusion in Nigeria's pre-immunization scheme is a statement to our nation's commitment to safeguarding the health and well-being of our young girls. Recognizing the importance of these milestones Various stakeholders, including religious institutions, community centers, and markets, have uh, united in support of this cause. Their active participation will help overcome initial resistance, enabling us to foster assistance and acceptance and understanding across all segments of society. To amplify our efforts and ensure widespread awareness, we have harnessed the power of media through jingles or radio, uh, compelling uh, television at, uh, at advertisements and the impactful social media campaigns. 
we have spread the word far and wide. These campaigns serve not only to educate, but also to alleviate any misconception around HIV vaccine. I wish to conclude by stating that Nigeria's resolute journey to address cervical cancer is marked by a collaborative partnership and waving a determination and a dedication to securing a healthier future for our young girls. Thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, I'm afraid we are running out of time. I will call just one more um, country before we turn to um, Camaros to um, wind up for us. Um, can I have the Democratic Republic of Congo? Thank you, Madam Chair, Moderator. The DRC uh, thanks the Regional Direct, uh, Director for having organized this special event on a topic which is very important because cervical cancer is a public health issue which has very heavy consequences on the survivors and also um, um, their people. The government of the DRC uh, plans to include HPV vaccine in the vaccine program, and we are seeking support from WHO and from our technical and financial partners. I would like to add my voice to that of the delegate from the World Bank, who earlier on spoke uh, about boys, he, about immunizing, immunization for boys, because in fact 70% of the uh, uh, throat cancer are due to papilloma virus, and there are other types like uh, um, candioma and other genital viruses. And in order not to leave anybody behind, we would like everybody to be um, treated, girls and boys. To conclude, DRC would like to have a final position of the WHO on uh, the uh, preference for two uh, regarding the preference for two doses of vaccine, which seems a bit difficult because sometimes our populations live in remote areas and uh, uh, find it difficult to access uh, places where they can get the vaccine. And if we, and we know that one dose could help us reach out to more people and overcome the problem uh, through prevention. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a topic I think many people have wanted to raise. Just before we go to the final panelist, um, Angola. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Dr. Moiti, distinguished panelists. Uh, with uh, the data of, uh, I agree with the data of 2020 for Angola where we had more than 20,000 new cases of cervical cancer. We are therefore facing a problem uh, or in relating to um, uh, data uh, and uh, the information that is available comes from the Angolan Institute for Cancer Control. And uh, um, it is in fact a type of cancer that impacts more on women uh, and um, it is um, represent 30% of uh, cancer in women and 70% of all other types of cancer. To improve the level of awareness of the population on the prevention of the disease, we need to carry out information, education, communication, and promote uh, um, life habits that would save people. Now, uh, we also uh, have to uh, draw lessons and uh, develop the technical capacity and uh, get equipment for prevention. The country developed recently a plan to introduce a vaccine, the HPV uh, vaccine. Uh, for the, in the past, in the next three years, uh, girls between nine and 14 years will be uh, vaccinated, and this will be funded by the government of Angola in coordination with the Ministry of Education and with the support of the Global Alliance for Vaccine, vaccine WHO, UNICEF, and other uh, partners. Therefore, one cannot, uh, in fact, not talk about the uh, impact 
need for the impact of the vaccine and um, on uh, to for the medium and long term. It is a major challenge for the Ministry of Health, uh, which wants to increase the coverage, diagnosis, and treatment of uh, cervical cancer. The scope of the problem of cervical cancer uh, requires a regional response, however, a concerted multi-sectoral approach that would promote advocacy and the mobilization of resources to implement or carry out preventive and curative actions for uh, Angola took the initiative to put, set up a foundation for Africa, that an Africa that would be free of cervical cancer. And we would like to reiterate again the fact that uh, Angola has signed all agreements, global agreement, for the elimination of cervical cancer and uh, uh, supports all uh, the activities that are enshrined in the report submitted to us. Thank you. And now we'll move to our final panelists before we close out. Um, I'd like to welcome Dr. Mohamed um, Sufudin from the Ministry of Health, Comoros. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. Uh, Excellency Dr. Moeti, uh, the Regional Director of the WHO for Africa, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, honorable ministers, I, what can I say that has not already been said, except that I will start by expressing, uh, sharing the regrets of the honorable minister who would have liked to be here personally, because in the, for the case of Comoros, uh, uh, cervical cancer was not really a, a topic, but because of the sensi um, sensitization from the minister, she became a pioneer of this uh, battle, and people are now beginning to talk about it. I would also like, uh, because here it is almost a debt uh, that I have, I would like to address on behalf of this, uh, the minister uh, the, uh, her thanks uh, to Mrs. Karen Akwala, who is a survivor of the cervical uh, cancer, and the minister uh, congratulates her for her audacity, her courage in participating in this meeting. And uh, you, from the minister says that you give a face and a soul to the statistics, and that from time to time we need such uh, life experiences to be able uh, to bring uh, more sensitivity, more, uh, make people more uh, sensitive to what we are doing. For the case of Comoros, Comoros are uh, victims of a double uh, uh, to the isolation, geographical isolation, medical isolation, uh, biological isolation, because in fact, uh, up, till, uh, up till now, uh, we uh, they have we have had too much uh, disparity, um, inequity in care for uh, cervical cancer, uh, and uh, we don't have a screening means for screening. Very often, uh, people are, patients are uh, screened uh, abroad, and COVID was really a revelation because we discovered that a lot of patients were being followed abroad, and because of the lockdown, they could not really uh, access treatment. And this, in fact, uh, drew the path for us to test, to f find out ways of uh, uh, providing treatment, uh, because we are limiting, but even though we are limited from the point of view of human resources. So that opportunity of uh, being able to discuss in our region is, was also a major opportunity because it will make it possible for us today to have a clearer vision and to try and see how we can commit ourselves in that battle, uh, uh, which is our collective battle. And uh, Comoros, therefore, commits itself to fight against cervical cancer uh, on the basis of the three main pillars, uh, 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 vaccine uh, screening and uh, treatment. So I would therefore say that um, uh, cervical cancer uh, must really be given its full meaning. And this is uh, that it is really an emergency nowadays. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, as we wrap up, I want to thank all of you for 
staying with us and staying with this very important topic. I think it's really important as we leave to thank all of the panelists for all of their remarks. It is so good to hear about countries where things are moving. We know that this is not perfect. We know that we have to make a much bigger effort. And we know that we've heard from countries that have started, but that we have at least half of our countries where we haven't even started. And we know that we can do more there. As Dr. Moetti said at the very beginning, we have the knowledge, we have the tools, we actually have the resources, even if sometimes it looks like a pathway to heaven to get to those resources. We aren't on track and we should be. We can be. And I hope that as you leave this room and go out to the reception where there will be some drinks and snacks and access to some of the resource partners that you've heard from today, that you will go out and you will go back home knowing that we have a duty to the boys, the girls, the women, the communities of Africa to be able to eradicate a disease that we have all the tools to do that with. I thank you all very, very much. And I would ask for the panelists, if you wouldn't mind going and standing by the flags as we finish, um, so that the co-hosts can join you and we can take a family picture. I thank you all very much. Please go and enjoy the reception. This year, Botswana will be the host for the 73rd session of the World Health Organization Regional Committee for Africa. The Regional Committee meets yearly to advance the regional health agenda, focusing on formulating policies, providing oversight for regional programs, revising